Good afternoon. It's uh, my great pl uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Ayal Gross, who's a professor at the law school at Tel Aviv University. Uh, he's also a vis visiting professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, which is where I, I got to know Ayal when I was a PhD student um, there. Uh, so Ayal is here with us today to speak uh, about his latest book, The Writing on the Wall, uh, Resinking the International Law of <coughs> Occupation. Um, which was published by Cambridge University Press uh, last year. So I will speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes on, on his book, and then uh, we'll have a, a conversation about, about the book and then open it to you for, for questions. So, uh, okay, so thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I know it's now uh, summertime and uh, not a holiday, and uh, so uh, if you came here, notwithstanding that, uh, I appreciate that means you're really interested in the topic. Um, so, uh, so thank you. And I, I want to thank uh, NUS, the Middle East Institute, for organizing it, and especially uh, Victor Katan uh, and Huda, uh, who put a lot of effort to organize it. And I was telling Huda that uh, I've done, actually, I, this is going to be, I think, the last of 11 book talks I've done in the last year since the book came out. I've done in London, a few in Israel, a few in the US, in Florence, in Paris in Cyprus, Slovenia, <laughs> but this was the most organized one because why we talked already to the website a few weeks ahead and other times it was all in the last minute, so thank you for organizing so efficiently and so uh, such a great way and, and hosting me so nicely in Singapore. My first time here, but I hope not the last because it's uh, really fascinating and it's great to be here. Um, so, um, uh, uh, as, as, as Victor mentioned, I, uh, Victor asked me to talk uh, for about half an hour about the topic of, of this book, which uh, you see, and, and, uh, I'll, uh, uh, um, and um, which was published last year. And <coughs> I know that uh, I was also warned that this is a Middle East Institute, not the law school, so most of you may not be lawyers, so I should be careful with uh, too much uh, legal uh, terms. So if I say something that you don't understand or use a term I don't understand, or say something too quickly, just raise your hand and let me know. So, you know, don't wait until the, I mean, wait with questions until the end, but something that you didn't understand, <laughs> ask me right away so we won't, uh, you won't sit frustrated for half an hour and say, what is this guy talking about? Because um, <coughs> my students always complain in the feedback form, speaks too fast, so if it happens, <laughs> tell me. <coughs> uh, so, uh, so, uh, uh, the book uh, that I, uh, I wrote is, in a way, it uh, does a few purposes. Uh, uh, I'm for Israel, as you know, and so uh, a large of it, the longest chapter, chapter three, is actually gives a sort of very detailed legal history of the Israeli occupation of the occupied Palestinian territory. But the, but, but the book uh, and my research doesn't look only at the Israeli occupation, but generally at the legal concept of occupation of uh, territory and uh, looks at other contemporary situations like uh, um, uh, Iraq when it was occupied by uh, American and British forces after 2003, uh, Northern Cyprus, which most of the international community considers as occupied by Turkey. Of course, it's disputed, but every occupation is disputed, right? Always people say, no, we are not almost always, people say we are not occupying it. Uh, Western Sahara, which is considered by much of the international community is occupied by Morocco, etc. So those are some of the other situations that I address in the book, even if in a way the focal point is the Israeli-Palestinian situation, which is why we are in the Middle East Institute. But, but uh, and actually, I would say that uh, all of the other situations that I mentioned are Middle East, if we consider Cyprus Middle East. Do we consider Cyprus Middle East? But we can, right? Uh, so actually, yeah, actually interests me. I didn't think about it. It's all Middle East. The, the major occupation I talk about. Asia. Pardon? I like to refer to the region of West Asia. West Asia, OK. Yes. Uh, once they used to say the Near East. No? Uh, so OK. Uh, it all depends where you measure, right? They used to say, here's the Far East once. But, uh, <coughs> so uh, you know, the West is as far from the East as the East is from the West. <laughs> Okay, <coughs> so um, never say the far west, right? Okay, um, okay. <laughs> so, um, I almost lost my train of thought. Um, 
So, okay, so occupation. Um, let's start talking about occupation. So, what is occupation? So, uh, normally when you think of occupation, we think of one territory occupying some, because of armed conflict, some territory beyond its recognized borders. Now, that's a very loose definition, and we can start getting into more arguments because what are the recognized borders? Uh, Etc. And, and 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 notice that I was very careful, and I said occupying the territory, occupying a territory beyond its recognized borders because of some armed conflicts. I didn't say a territory for another country, but some people, like Israel, would say, no, no, occupy the, occupy a territory of another state, and we didn't occupy a territory for another state because uh, there was never a state, an independent state of Palestine. So we may go into those questions later. But I'm, I was very careful and I took a, a broader definition that said when you occupy some territory which is beyond your recognized borders, that's how I would normally think of, of occupation, even though it's true that traditionally people used to say when you occupy a territory of another state. But today we have situations like occupied Palestinian territory, but also like Western Sahara, uh, where the territory that many people Consider occupied, it was never an independent state. It was territory that somehow, in the shift from colonialism to the post colonial era, never gained independence, but then someone else came in. And, and, and right, so Western Sahara was occupied by Spain or colonialized by Spain, but then when Spain left, Morocco came in and said, oh, but it's ours, it's part of our territory. And the, and, and the Sahrawi, uh, people said, no, we are, uh, it's not part of your territory. We, the, the, we have the right, our own right to self-determination. The International Court of Justice accepted their position and said Western Sahara is not part of Morocco and the Western Sahara has its right to self-determination which should be fulfilled and they should have the right to choose whether they do want to be part of Morocco or become an independent state. And since the International Court of Justice said that in 1975, we are all still waiting for a referendum in Western Sahara so the people, the Sahrawi people can determine the future, but it didn't happen yet. Uh, why am I saying all of this? Because to show that the Israeli-Palestinian case is not the only case where you occupy a territory that wasn't an independent state or wasn't part of independent state before, right? In Israel-Palestine, there was the British mandate and uh, over all of Palestine, I'm not starting even older with the Ottoman Empire, but there was a British mandate, and when, and this Victor knows more about because he wrote about the history, and he, I'm, not so, I'm not a historical person, he is more than I am, <laughs> but, in, 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 uh, but uh, in, in 47, when the British mandate was coming to the end, the UN decided on a petition plan, and, and, and then, uh, Right, and then in, uh, in uh, but and then in, in 48 there was a war, and in the end of the war, and I'm not going to go now into blaming who's to f who's to blame because that's not the point. Right, in the end of the war, there was an independent state of Israel, and another part of the territory, uh, which is what we today call the occupied Palestinian territory, was occupied by Jordan on one hand or Egypt on the other hand, and in 67 Israel occupied that from those territories, the West Bank from. Jordan and Gaza from Egypt. So, so there was never an independent, independent Palestinian state came into being as envisaged, envisaged in the petition plan for Palestine. And, and if, right, first Jordan and Egypt controlled those territories and, and now Israel. Uh, so, uh, but this brings to some of the complications and some of the questions because from the beginning, it's not this one country occupied another country, as for example, when Iraq occupied Kuwait, or when US and UK occupied Iraq. That's kind of occupation where one state occupies another state or part of another state. That's not, it was a bit different here. It does bring some complications. <clears throat> and of course, it does allow for countries like Israel to say it's not exactly occupation because we didn't really occupy territory for another land. It has ever, that's why it's not, Occupied territories, it's disputed territories. But if we would look at the Israel position, you see it's a bit more complicated. The Israel position, that's part of my argument, at the same time, recognize and deny that it's occupied territory. Doesn't totally deny, but doesn't fully recognize. And this is a crucial point, I think, this uh, dualism. And I'll go back to that. Okay, so far so good.
Okay? Okay. Now, what uh, I try, now, there have been a lot of critiques of how countries, including Israel, uh, don't uh, fulfill uh, the law of occupation entirely. Now, I'm from Israel, so I'm very interested in what happened in Israel, and I think that uh, not, I'm, I don't agree with a lot of things that uh, the government does, but it's true that Israel is not unique in the sense that also other countries don't fully fulfill the law of occupation. Um, uh, but the book is not so much interested to only ask if countries fulfill the law of occupation properly or not. It also asks, are there problems in the law of occupation itself? Right? Should we also think critically not about whether Israel or U.S. when it occupied Iraq or Iraq when it occupied Kuwait fulfilled the law of occupation properly or not? Because none of them did. Okay, <laughs> But also, where's the... I don't know if one country occupied and fulfilled the law of occupation fully, actually. It's a good question. We have to think about it. Uh, maybe in the uh, ethiopia Eritrea war, they occupied some land for some time, and, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, it was also one of those few last wars that is uh, two, you know, really one, traditional, one, country, one state against one state, you know. Uh, okay, so, so when I want to start asking critical questions about the law of occupation, uh, I, I want to start by bringing you uh, two statements um, uh, from two people who were architects of two of the occupation I mentioned. So uh, this gentleman uh, is Mr. Shamgar. He, uh, in 67, when Israel occupied uh, the West Bank and Gaza, the occupied Palestinian territory, he was uh, the um, uh, judge advocate general, so the head of the military, uh, military uh, legal department. And later he was Israel legal advisor of the Ministry of Defense. And then he was attorney general. And then he was Supreme Court justice. And then he was chief justice. And now he's just retired, happily. Uh, uh, so in all those positions, he really fulfilled uh, uh, an important role in shaping the Israeli legal policy about the occupation. Someone should write, write an article just about he shaped the Israeli legal position of the occupation. Uh, he, uh, before Israel was independent, he was part of the Irgun, which was a right-wing group from which uh, the Likud party grew up eventually, yes. But I don't know his position later. He never f expressed, because in Israel, judges are not allowed to express political positions. So uh, maybe he changed, I don't know. Uh, but historically, he was part of the Irgun, yeah. Um, so <coughs> um, so uh, after Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza in 67, uh, Shamgar said a lot of things, and he was, as I said, because he was the judge advocate general at 67, he was really the most influential, and also through his Supreme Court judgment, because he was the judge when the big cases started coming to the court. So he really, really shaped the legal policy. And he once said, in one, uh, I, think, I think this is in the early 70s, I have the quote in the book to exact reference, he said, occupation is a factual situation. Pending solution, this system of government could, from a legal point of view, and remember we are talking about the law, from a legal point of view, continue indefinitely. And somewhat similarly, uh, Paul Bremer, who was head of the Coalition Provisional Authority, that's um, the, actually the body uh, that managed the American and British occupation of Iraq after 2003, when they occupied Iraq, uh, he said, occupation is an ugly word, not one American feel comfortable with, but it is a fact. So one of the things that I want to question in my work and in this book is, is occupation really just a fact? Is it just a factual situation? Is it a situation that can continue indefinitely? Now, uh, to many, many actually non-lawyers have better intuition about this than lawyers, because they think occupation, you occupy another territory, it's illegal. But actually, law is not um, as uh, intuitively uh, saying what you may have thought. Because law traditionally consider occupation as a factual situation in the sense that there are wars between countries one, or, or between countries and other factors, as we mentioned, or not, countries and uh, liberation movements, people. And one uh, state occupies a territory beyond its border, traditionally between countries. And, 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 and now we have to think about how this territory is managed. Now, uh, now, in the past, there were all sorts of things, uh, international law legitimized uh, colonialism. Uh, Professor T Tony Angi from this law school, from NUS law school, 
he wrote a very famous book about how international law legitimized colonialism, critiquing that historically. And there was also an idea called the right of conquest, that if you occupy the territory, you could annex it, it become yours, etc. Now, we traditionally think of the law of occupation as something, as uh, a modern law of occupation, that actually came to replace those ideas and came to say, yes, you may still occupy territory in, in, in situation of armed conflict, but when you do that, um, um, and, and, and now I'm relying on an article I wrote with two colleagues, uh, when you do that, actually there are a few principles that guide it. And, and what are the main principles? And so when you start reading international law you're all about occupation, you'll always read the saying that occupation doesn't give you sovereignty. So the idea is that if you occupy a territory beyond your borders, it doesn't give you sovereignty in this territory. It's just supposed to be, you have to manage it um, uh, uh, for, in, according to the Hague regulations in a way that will uh, re uh, sustain public order and civic life in the occupied territory. And, 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 and in this article, we made an argument, which that, that itself is not such a novel argument, it's, but that occupation is temporary. And occupation cannot, and ca cannot be permanent or indefinite, because in, if we will take out those principles and say, I occupy a territory, I can treat it like it's my own, I think I have sovereignty in it now. I annex it, or I act in it as if I annexed it, and I control it indefinitely in a way that shows that I want to control it definitely then we start asking what's the difference between that and, and regimes that are today considered illegal, like conquest or colonialism. And now the law of occupation, if you read histories of the law of occupation, it is explained that it, 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 it developed with the development of the principle, some principle in international law. Of course, self-determination, because if we believe in the idea of self-determination of people, we do not believe anymore that colonialism or conquest is possible, that someone else will come and control you without your consent. Uh, the idea of sovereignty, but in a universal way, the idea that every people have and every state have sovereignty, not only you know, the colonizers. Uh, and uh, the idea of prohibition on, of use uh, of force in international law, and with that comes the prohibition on acquisition of land by force. And that means if you seize the land by force, it doesn't become yours. You are just the occupier, which is this temporary situation. So in that article, which the book uh, continues, we argue that occupation that violates those principles is illegal. Because we said we shouldn't treat occupation just as a factual situation that pending solution could continue indefinitely. We should also treat it as a normative situation that cannot continue indefinitely, because there are norms at the heart of the law of occupation. And if we take out those norms, what's the difference between occupation and regimes which are today considered illegal, like, like uh, uh, conquest, colonialism, or uh, apartheid, which actually may become a situation if the occupying people, occupying state, put its own citizens in the occupied territory, and, but doesn't annex the territory, so you end up having two different population with different laws governing the lives, and some people argue that is akin to apartheid. So how do we prevent the law of occupation to become something that because occupation is not considered an illegal regime per se, it's considered, okay, it's just these factual situations that happen, how do we prevent it from becoming you know, uh, something that will legitimize something that in de facto is not so different from the illegal regime? And we argue the only way to do it is to say, Okay, it's occupation, but it's an illegal one if you don't maintain those principles. And we argued that the Israeli occupation is no longer legal because Israel violated those principles because it do, did a de facto annexation of the territories by putting settlements there, Israeli citizens, and it benefits the settlers at the expense of the Palestinians by taking land and water, so it doesn't manage it as a trust for the benefit of the local population, and when you settle hundreds of thousands of your citizens in a territory, it shows an indication to continue controlling it indefinitely, and not just as a temporary thing, until there's some arrangement. Now we could say, and that's a point that I don't think I made in the book, but I think I should have made, that there is a lacuna in the law of occupation, because this uh, uh, third Geneva Convention, which deals with prisoners of war, says that at the end of the hostilities, prisoners have to be returned to the countries. And the fourth Geneva Convention sh should have said that at the end of the hostilities, territories occupied should be returned to whoever they were occupied from. 
But he doesn't say that. He should have said that. Maybe he doesn't say it because, uh, I don't know, we can bring up conspiracy theories that they actually wanted to legitimize the new forms of colonialism. I don't know. I leave this to people doing historical research like Victor. <laughs> but, uh, but, but in any case, it's, 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 I think that's, that's a, a lacuna. Now, of course, the law of occupation does say a lot of other things that indicate the temporary nature. It says you should respect the existing laws in the country. Okay, you shouldn't change the laws unless absolutely necessary. So when you tell an occupier you are not allowed to change the laws in the territory you occupied unless absolutely necessary, you tell them, right? A sovereign state is allowed to change laws. Uh, you tell them you are not a sovereign. When a uh, uh, law of occupation says you are not allowed to settle your own citizens in the occupied territory, uh, that's why most people that I know that do international law say settlements are illegal. So that's another indication. It's not your sovereign ter territory, it's temporary, right? Because if the law of occupation was intended to allow you to control it indefinitely and treat it as your own sovereign territory, it would not prohibit you from settling your citizens there. So there are a lot of indications to show those as a guiding principle. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, just time to show you the importance of, of, uh, of time. And sorry that Victor saw a bit of this in the 12 conference last week. So. Uh, sorry for the repeat, uh, but uh, but that was the only uh, much shorter version. Now it's a uh, that was like the sneak preview, and now it's like the full film. Uh, so uh, um, <coughs> so uh, we can have a whole discussion about the question of the settlement Israel built in the West Bank, also in Gaza. But it Israel did take out settlements out of Gaza, but and the legality and how it. We can talk about it, but I'm just focusing on one element now. So in one of the early cases in the Israel Supreme Court regarding the settlements, uh, Justice uh, Ben Porat, who used to be in the Israel Supreme Court, she's already dead, she's retired and she died uh, two years ago. So she um, uh, dealt with the follow. She suddenly faced a dilemma. Uh, now, when Israel, the, the, ca the case, for reasons that I can explain to you later, did not deal per se with the question of the legality of settlements under the Geneva Convention, uh, and whether it's legal to transfer a civilian population. It dealt more specifically, what the court dealt, did engage with was a seizing of the land uh, uh, by the government for the purpose of building settlements. Now, when you see the land for military purposes under the Hague regulations, the, the international of occupation is governed mostly by two bodies of international law, the Hague regulations and the Geneva Convention. So just that you know, for those of you who are not lawyers, if I say it's Hague Regulation from 1907, Geneva Convention from 1949. Um, so it's two very famous international law treaties for those of you who are not uh, lawyers. Um, uh, so, uh, so under the Hague Regulations, when you seize land for military purposes in an occupied territory, it has to be for a temporary thing for a military need. It is allowed to do it if there is a military need. You have to show the military need. But of course, any seizing of land for, seizing of land for military need is, is a temporary by nature. So, uh, so the justice said, the judge said, look, I'm, I have a problem here. Uh, on one hand, they seize land on a mil for military purposes, which is a temporary act. And, and every act of the military occupier is supposed to be temporary because it's a temporary form of control. On the other hand, the planning scheme for the settlements were not for some uh, temporary settlement. It was for a permanent, establishing a permanent settlement. You know, it was not that we are doing some prefab houses and some tents. It was a planning for a permanent settlement, as far as planning laws, right, etc., building like a village or a town. So he said, I was concerned with whether the term permanent settlement in the planning schemes indicates an intention to take the land indefinitely, which you're not supposed to do when you seize land for military purposes, because your army has to say there's a military need, and I need it now for some military need, but that's always, as I said, temporary by nature. But reach a conclusion that the term permanent should be treated as merely relative. OK, now, we all know that time is relative. That's not a, a novelty from the court. We learned it from this gentleman. Uh, um, uh, but what happened when indefinite become, when, sorry, permanent become uh, a, a relative term? Uh, now we know that nothing is permanent in death, right? Except for in life, except for death and the taxes that we'll pay until that. That's why I always say that the problem with occupation is not that it's permanent. It may end one day. I hope so. It's a problem that it is indefinite. That it's not okay. This temporary thing. There was a war. We seized some land, and until there's an agreement, etc. So, but you see here how neglecting the principle of temporal 
temporality. And making it relative allows for the, to undermine the protection of the law of occupation and to continue indefinitely. And that comes at the expense of people living under occupation. Now, uh, to just bring one more case, a much later case from 2013, uh, over the years, Israel built quarries in the West Bank uh, from which it took land and stone and gravel for construction, including construction inside Israel proper. And um, uh, in, uh, sorry, in one, okay, see some, it's not something is wrong here, but you get the principle of what the slide said. Uh, so in one, uh, sorry, one, uh, so in, in 2011, uh, uh, the Israel Supreme Court dealt with a case where uh, an NGO called Yashdin argued that this is a violation of the law of occupation, of the principles that say that you're not supposed to uh, use the natural resources of the land, you're not supposed to take the natural resources of occupied territory. And the court said uh, a lot of things, which I uh, dealt with Article 55 with the Hague regulation, which <laughs> deals with natural res <coughs> sorry, resources in occupied territory, but I won't bore you with a detailed legal analysis of this because this becomes uh, only something only us international lawyers have to suffer so much. Uh, but, uh, but the court said, look, the Israel religion occupation is of special features, mostly the length of the holding, which requires fitting the law to the reality on the ground. Traditional occupation law requires it should be taking into account the length of the occupation. Also talk about the role of the Oslo Accords, but I'll leave that for a moment. So actually the court tells us this occupation is long, so so it's not like a regular occupation anymore. Uh, it actually, the court almost says it like we sort of annexed it, right? It's, but I would say it's a partial annexation because Israel established settlement in the occupied territories and it extended its laws to uh, the settlers and settlement, but it didn't really annex it because for annexation you would have to also give the, citizen, the residents of the territory uh, citizens in the in Israel, which of course Israel doesn't want to do, the Palestinians that is. So I hope you, I showed you the issue with uh, temporality, and, and, and you see that the rejection of the nature of occupation as temporary creates a vicious circle of more violation of the law of occupation. You know, you build settlements, and then you say, okay, now I need a wall to protect the settlements, and, and we can go into that more and more. Blurring the line between occupation and regime illegal per se, like conquest, colonialism, or apartheid. So one of the questions I'm interested in is, does the law of occupation protect civilians during war and occupation? Displacing prohibited regimes like colonialism, conquest, or apartheid by securing control of occupied territory is temporary? Or is it the emperor's new clause of regimes today considered illegal? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one found the stuff the book deal with. Now, I'm going to try and, and explain to you about this chart and then uh, move to, should start finishing soon, but if you like, a few more minutes, Victor, okay? Yeah. Okay, so, so just to try and give you a picture about uh, the West Bank. So we already mentioned the West Bank, Israel occupied in 67. It was part of the territory that was supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, the future Palestinian state under the partition plan the UN adopted in 1947. And, um, now, when Israel occupied it, at the political level, it often said it's not occupied, it disputed territory, etc. On the legal level, it's a bit more complicated because Israel did not deny the application of the Hague regulations, which I mentioned to you before, which are from 1907. And they deal extensively with the authority of the military commander in an occupied territory. When can he seize land and when can he not seize land? They deal with a lot of things. But then, um, uh, the other Geneva Convention, which are from 1949, and especially the fourth Geneva Convention, which deal with the protection of civilians in wartime and occupation. And, and the Geneva Convention said, okay, I, I can't even go into exactly what it says because it will take us too long, but Israel said the Geneva Convention applies when one country occupies the territory of another country, and we didn't do that. It's not the territory of another state, it, as I said before, because it was, they didn't belong to any other state before. The Geneva Convention does not apply. Now, uh, and of course, for Israel, it was very important to do it, to say that, because Geneva Convention also includes in Article 49 the principle that occupying countries are not allowed to transfer civilian population, their civilian population to the occupied territory. And as you know, Israel has pretty much from shortly after 67, especially after 77, it grew, but even before it started, 
um, established settlements in the West Bank where actually Israeli uh, citizens live. Now, Israel said, first of all, Geneva Convention doesn't apply. Second, even if it were to apply, we did not transfer our civilian population. People moved there out of their own free will. And therefore, it's not applicable. That's the Israeli position. Now, if you ask the International Court of Justice, uh, in its the advisory opinion it gave regarding the construction of the wall in the West Bank, the, uh, the International Court of Justice took the opposite position. It said the Geneva Convention applies, and it said the settlements are illegal. And, and that's, I think if you do a poll among international lawyers, most of them will say that. Not even, even among international lawyers in Israel, most of them would say that. Would say, no, we think there's a problem here with the law, because we think the Geneva Convention applies. And we think that, okay, it's not if just individual. I would tomorrow go and want, I want to live in the West Bank. Yeah, that's not a violation. But Israel actually established cities and towns, right? So they would say that considered transfer of civilian population. It's true that Israel did force them, but it's not that they went individually. Of course, if someone goes individually to live there, that's not transfer of the civilian population. And then Israel would have been right, but the hundreds of thousands that live there live in cities and towns which were established by the government and even sometimes encouraged because at some stage the government subsidized and gave better financial conditions to go and live there. So, so uh, now, so the situation that happened in the West Bank, now I would add one thing. Israel did say we will abide by the humanitarian provision of the Geneva Convention even if it doesn't apply. So if the Geneva Convention says you have to treat the people fairly and also give them fair trial and not to do collective punishment, we will do that. Did they do it? I'm not sure because quite a lot of things that Israel did, people argued that collective punishment, for example, like home demolitions of people whose family members were involved in terror. So many people would say Israel said it will abide by the convention but didn't always abide by it. And of course it did not abide by it, they will say, yes, I would also say personally, when it comes to settlements issue, okay? Uh, so uh, what happens? We see that the situation is that Israel does enjoy the legal authority of occupier in the West Bank through the Hague regulation. There's a military commander, military regime, but in other application of Geneva. But it also acts partly as a sovereign in the sense that it establishes cities and towns. The hundreds of thousands of Israelis living there. Israel applied the laws in personam and geographically to the settlement and settlement, its own laws. But it, so, and the International Court of Justice, in the World Advisory Opinion, said the settlements could be part of an impending de facto annexation. I agree with this, but I will add partial annexation or selective annexation because it's not an annexation that gives citizenship right to the residents of the territory. Israel annexed East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights, and Golan Heights was occupied from Syria, so it's a different story in 67. And East Jerusalem is... Victor is now writing about Jerusalem, so he can tell you. That's, you, you need to do... I, I gave a, a talk in some uh, podcast about this book, and then they asked me about Jerusalem, and I said, you need a whole book about that separately. You know, it's a, like a whole separate legal complication. But when Israel annexed East Jerusalem and the West Bank, uh, and sorry, East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights, he did, I would say nominally, it made it very hard for them to do it, but he did offer the residents of this territory the possibility to get Israel citizenship. Okay? It will do everything bureaucratically impossible for them to get it, but nominally, it says you can, we are next that you become our citizens. Israel doesn't want to do it in the West Bank. Why? Because Israel had this idea that it wants to remain a state with a Jewish majority. And if Israel were to annex the West Bank and give, offer citizenship to all the Palestinians living there, it would be a binational state and not a 80% Jewish population state. And this would undermine the Zionist ideas, right? So Israel, I would say, wants the land, but not the people. So, um, 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 so uh, and that's really the, the heart of the story and the paradox. So, it's a partial annexation without, it's a partial de facto annexation of some of the West Bank. And the Palestinians, on one hand, are not offered, Palestinians from the West Bank, you know, in Israel we have 20% of the population which are Palestinian Israelis. But that's to be distinguished from the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. The Palestinians in the occupied territories are not offered Israeli citizenship, on one hand. On the other hand, they don't get the full rights of protected persons, this is a technical term, from the Geneva Convention, because Israel denied the application of Geneva, and Israel, especially concerning establishing settlements, actually dispossesses them. 
it often takes land and takes water for the settlements. So the whole idea of prohibiting settlements is, is to a large extent to protect the local population from this possession by settlements, etc. Okay, so I think this is the situation we are now in, and I'm not going to the political discussion, who's to blame, why didn't we reach peace so far in the negotiation, because that's really a question of political and historical dispute. That's the situation, who's to blame? We live to discussion after class or after the seminar, but <laughs> political discussion. I'm willing to do it, but you know, but but uh, uh, I think that's the structure that we have uh, now. Uh, now, I'll, okay, I'll just say five points about this question. Five minutes, and then I'll finish. Uh, so, another important question to be addressed: When does occupation exist? When does it end? In 2005, Israel said, "We remember there is a West Bank, which is." I should have bought a map maybe, but the West Bank is right to the, uh, between Israel and Jordan. Uh, I mean, on the west side of the Jordan River, but between Israel and the state of Jordan. And there's Gaza, which is, so to say, between Israel and Egypt, more or less. And um, so uh, uh, in 2005, Israel said, we are pulling our permanent uh, military presence and our settlements from Gaza. This is what was called the disengagement plan. And then Israel said, we don't longer occupy Gaza. But Israel continued to exercise much control over Gaza from the external perimeter. Israel controlled the waterways, the airspace, most of the land crossing, except for the land crossing with Egypt. There is a land crossing with Egypt. So the question started, does, does that mean the occupation ended? Or if Israel took out the settlements and the permanent military presence, but still controlled so much of life there, does occupation continue? And there was even a question about Iraq. At some stage, it is still occupied by US and UK or not, but I won't go into that. And I won't go into the whole legal theory debate here. So I would just say that another question the book asks is, are we too much stuck with traditional concepts of occupation? Because when uh, there was this, this uh, debate, a lot of uh, our colleagues in international law said, yeah, but occupation, we have to have boots on the ground. That's a term that international humanitarian lawyers love, love to use, boots on the ground. You have to have the army actually present in the territory and controlling it, otherwise it's not occupation. So how can people say Gaza is, not, is still occupied? And other people said, yes, but you have to understand the forms of control change legally and politically, uh, sorry, politically and technologically. And today you can often do remote control. You con so it doesn't mean control didn't change, but there is still control from the external perimeter. Now traditionally you think about occupation, you see, Friction, you see interaction between civilian population, occupying army. But what happens when a country arguably wants to continue controlling but less friction? And I would say this is apparent not only in the Gaza disengagement, but also by uh, establishment of the wall, uh, the Oslo Accords, which we didn't talk about, and the privatization of checkpoints, all of, all of actions which, in a way, Part of the purpose is at least to reduce the friction between the occupying army and the civilian population. So it would look less like occupation, but on the other hand, a lot of control continues. So I don't want to go over all this question, but is it all or nothing? We think, we think in a more functional way. Can we say that, yes, controlling Gaza transformed, but maybe it's not occupied in a traditional way, but Israel continues to exercise a lot of control over different functions of life in Gaza. And it has at least the duties of occupier regarding these functions. Now, this has practical implications because in cases regarding uh, uh, right to education, for example, uh, people who want to go uh, from uh, Gaza to the West Bank to study, uh, concerning food security and, and, and provi provisions of food and uh, the effect on the Israeli siege on Gaza on food security. In all of those cases, the Israeli position has been, and also I would say the position of the Israeli court generally has been, that because Israel is no longer occupying Gaza, it doesn't have the duties of an occupier. It doesn't have the duty to provide for the local population like an occupier. It has a much more minimal duty of someone you are belligerent with and not someone you control. Whereas in reality, the Israeli, for example, the Israeli siege over Gaza, the control of the waterways, airways, and uh, most of the land crossing has tremendous effect on life in Gaza, has tremendous effect on people's ability to move, on goods' ability to move, and thus on issues like food security, ability to study, etc. So part of the book, what the book argues is that we have to think that even if it doesn't look like traditional occupation, as long as you continue to exercise control, there is at least functional occupation of the function you control, and you should have the duty of occupier to provide and maintain and sustain for the local population uh, uh, regarding that. So that's part of what those questions are about, which I won't go one by one. Um, so. 
uh, and I think there is some, I, I don't want to go into legal cases here, there are some, we can analyze the legal case in occupation maybe later, uh, but what I want to say is that we see the changes in control, less friction, more invisible. Uh, I won't talk about the application of human rights on occupation because that's a whole interesting story by itself. You can read more in the book. If we can do the pitch, uh, discount forms outside. Thank you. <laughs>